Oh, well, exam three can be terrifying. <coughs> Ask him to find out. <coughs> but, like I say, this is 100 points. The actual exam will look very much like it. Um, and uh, do you have a copy of that? I do not. Somebody. Thank you. All right, we start off with the exam with this page here, which is basically just simple nomenclature. Um, there will be a nomenclature page on the exam that will look a lot like this. For these, you're given, um, in spite of what it says up here, you're given structures and you're asked to provide names. Um, that's a fairly trivial exercise for you now, I hope. Let's look at these one at a time. I hope that you've uh, taken the time to work through it. Um, we'll go through them slowly, just in case you haven't. We look at our first compound here. We have one, two, three, four carbons in our parent chain. And it's an alkene. So we're dealing with a butene. We also have a hydroxyl <coughs> group here that's going to be um, on carbon number one. So by definition, we want to give the alcohol the lowest number. So our numbering is going to look something like this. We have a four carbon parent, that's a butte. It has a double bond at carbon two, so it's a two butene. Methyl group at three, and hydroxyl group at one, so that's a one all. Stringing them all together, we get three methyl. One butene, one all. Remember you drop off the last E on the butene when you <coughs> stick something else after it. Make sure we can go backwards. If we were doing this backwards, I'd always begin here with the two butene. So we have a four carbon parent, double bond in carbon two, alcohol in carbon one, methyl group in carbon three. Any questions? Our next guy here, this is an alkyne. Nothing else is in the molecule. So we want to let, or give the alkyne the lowest possible number, which means we're gonna start numbering up here on our chain. We have a one, two, three, four carbon parent, so that's a butte. It is an alkyne, so it's a butyne. It is a one, butyne with a methyl group here in carbon 3. 3 methyl, 1 butyne. Also note that, let's go back to the first one here. Um, the most recent iteration of the IUPAC rules makes it preferable to actually break here between the T and the E and put a dash. So this is 3-methyl-bute-2-ene-1-all. But I prefer this. I think it makes it string together a little easier. Either one is still acceptable. Your book uses um, this method. All right, our third one here. Well, we have stereochemistry. Now, this structure differs just slightly from the one that's on the exam itself. Here I have elaborated the serial chemistry so you can see it better. We're going to have to include R or S in our name. Um, finding our parent. Once again, it's an alkyne. So we want to let this be carbon 1 out here. Following down the longest chain, we have one, two, three, four, five, so it's a pentine. Uh, the triple bond is in carbon one, so it's a one pentine. Only thing we have to do is think about the R and S stuff. Now, in terms of the priorities, <coughs> here we have a carbon bonded to three other carbons, triple bond. 
So this is going to be number one. This carbon is two hydrogens and another carbon, which beats three hydrogens. So our priorities would look like this. Now if we string these together in a loop, that would be a clockwise loop. However, our hydrogen is pointing towards the front, isn't it? Remember, we always take the lowest priority group to the back. When we do that, that reverses our clockwise rotation. We get counterclockwise. Therefore, this is going to be an S. So one more time, we have a pentine triple bond in carbon-1 and its S configuration. S, 3-methyl, 1 pentine. Yeah. When I printed it out, um, it was just straight line. Right. There was no and that's called a Fisher projection. We talked about that. The uh, Fisher projection, the little just straight cross. Uh, by definition, in a Fisher projection, the horizontal guys are coming towards you. So that's the same thing as I've shown here. Um, it's just it's easier just to show the methyl back and put the triple bond in the way. Um, Fisher projections used to be covered up earlier in the text, and they should be, because they're very useful, actually. Yeah? Dr. Young, uh, the Fisher projections, it's like a bow tie. Now, the, the ones that go up and down, are they back? They're back. Okay, I'll okay, fine. It's like the methyl back. But it's not showing on the CH2. Right. That's back too, right? Uh, right, this is back, well, uh, Are they always back, in, sir? In this perspective drawing, I put both of these in the plane. Oh. And one back, one forward. In the true fissure, both horizontal groups are forward, both vertical groups are back. Fissure projections are actually useful because uh, you can compare um, chiral structures with fissures and just do a very simple operation called an exchange operation uh, to figure out if um, the two structures are the same or different. And it was a very nice way to, uh, to address without having to visualize everything in 3D. But they moved it. That's a shame. All right, our last one here. We have an alcohol on a side chain. We have a phenyl group. Now, because the alcohol is the highest priority functional group, we're going to have to name this as our parent, <clears throat> which means we have a two-carbon parent. Um, a two-carbon alcohol is ethanol. We have attached to carbon number two, a phenyl group, and this is simply two-phenyl ethanol. Here you don't need the one to show that we have the alcohol in carbon number one because you only have two carbons. So um, if you put it in, it would not be um, really bad, but it's totally unnecessary. All right, here we're doing backwards. The last two on the first page. We are given names and we are simply expected to provide a structure. We are dealing here with a pentane diol. So we start off with a five carbon parent. On the five carbon parent, we go to carbons two and three and we put in hydroxyl. There's no stereochemistry indicated, so we just stick a pen. <coughs> we want to uh, keep track of our numbering here. Two and three are going to be the alcohols. Out of our pentane on carbon four, we're going to stick a methyl group. I think something like this would work. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five. There's a pentane parent. Hydroxyl groups at two and three. Now, these are chiral centers, but stereochemistry is not indicated. 
And finally, a methyl group here at carbon four. Any questions? Our next one, we're dealing with a hexine. So we have a six carbon parent. We're going to put a triple bond in there. It's a two hexine. So the first carbon of our triple bond is going to be on carbon number two. Working down our chain from there to carbon five, we're going to stick a methyl group on. And it should look like this. <clears throat> Here's our six carbon parent. On carbon two, we have our triple bond. On carbon five, we have a methyl group. Any chiral centers here? Oh, of course not. <clears throat> this would be the only possible candidate, but we have two methyls, so that doesn't work. Any questions on the simple nomenclature? The nomenclature that you have on the exam will be comparable in difficulty to these and diversity. All right, next we have two full pages of reactions. On your exam, you will also have two full pages of reactions. As a random act of kindness, when you write the structures on the exam, please do it carefully. See how nice and pretty my structures look? Make yours the same way, so it's easy for me to figure out what you've done. Our first reaction here, we have an alkyne. We have BH3 and THF, followed by oxidative workup. Now we remember this all the way back from chapter 8. We know that if we took an alkene and we did hydroboration oxidation, that we would get an anti marconicol alcohol. Well, we're going to get the same thing with an alkyne. We're going to get an anti marconicol enol. The only difference is that the enol is going to undergo rearrangement, a tautomerization it's called, to give a ketone or an aldehyde. Okay? Well, we need to look at our triple bond and decide which of these is the Marconicloff carbon. So which of these is going to be, would be the most stable carbocation. Um, this just has a hydrogen, <coughs> this is attached to a carbon, therefore this is going to be our Marconicloff carbon, and this guy on the end, the terminal, is the anti. Therefore, we're going to put a hydroxyl group on the terminal carbon, making it an enol that will then rearrange to an aldehyde. Our carbon chain is the same. Please note that we have one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Methyl group out here. And we've gone from the alkyne to the aldehyde. Make sure, even though it wasn't on this exam, that you can draw an enol, or take an enol anyway, and show how you undergo the tautomerization reaction to form the aldehyde. We'll keep it. Any questions? All right, next, we have a simple uh, ketone. If we had done the chapter on conjugation, we would call this an alpha beta unsaturated ketone. What that means is that these two are actually conjugated. There's resonance between these guys. It's just one simple resonance system. Um, we'll see that we can do lots and lots of nice chemistry with these. 
but you'll do that next semester. All right, so we're going to take this conjugated ketone. We're going to react it with methyl magnesium bromide, followed by acidic workup. All the acidic workup does is wash away all the inorganic stuff and protonate the oxyamide. So the Grignard is going to come and very cleanly attack the carbonyl carbon. Carbonyl carbon will become an OH. A methyl group will be attached here, and it will look like this. The Grignard will not mess with the double bond. Actually, it turns out that if we had an alkyl lithium up in wood, the alkyl lithium would actually undergo addition to the terminal carbon here, but that's a different reaction. That's a different chapter. All right, our next one. We have a terminal alkyne. Terminal alkyne simply means it has a hydrogen on the end. Remember, alkynes are mildly acidic. They have a pKa of about 19. Water is about 15. Um, so it is you know, 10,000 times less acidic than water. But nonetheless, we can yank this proton off and form an anion. We do that using sodium amide. Sodium amide you prepare by taking liquid ammonia and you add little chunks of sodium. There are actually two reactions that we do with sodium and liquid ammonia with alkynes. One is this guy where we take and we dissolve the sodium in the liquid ammonia at step one. Then for step two, you dump in your methyl iodide and your alkyne. Um, the other one is the dissolving metal reduction. And for that, you put your alkyne in uh, the liquid ammonia, then you add the sodium. So this is sodium previously dissolved in liquid ammonia. All right. This is a very strong base. Yanks this off, makes the anion. And I is now going to attack the methyl group SN2 reaction, and we wind up with the substituted alkyne. Any question? Trivial reaction. All right, our next step. We are looking at PBr3 in ether, and we're reacting that with an alcohol. Now we remember that phosphorus bicarbonate will react with alcohols to form a phosphite ester. The phosphite ester <coughs> is a very good leaving group. When we do that, we clip out a bromide anion as we make the ester. That's our nucleophile. With PBr3, the nucleophile is going to attack on the opposite face of the hydroxyl group. So it's an SN2 reaction, and it proceeds with inversion. So we have to show a couple things here. We, of course, have to convert this to the alkyl bromide. That's our product. But we also have to show our stereochemistry as inverted. Now, the simplest way to show that it has inverted is simply to take your structure, as it is, and just swap to the, uh, the orientation of two of the groups. That's the simplest way you change orientation of any two groups, that's inversion. So, this would work. I move my hydrogen forward, put my bromine in the back, so I've swapped my orientation here, 
and we've gone from um, R to S stereochemistry. Once again, the simplest way to show this is just to take um, any two groups, any two, and change their orientation. If you do that, that's the same as an inversion of configuration. Any question? Do you have a copy of the uh, exam? Yes. All right. Here we have an alkyne. We have aqueous acid and we have mercury 2 present. <clears throat> we know if this was an alkene, an alkene will react with mercury 2 acetate to form an intermediate mercury ion, and we wind up with an organic mercurial. Eventually, uh, we reduce that off with bisulfite and get an alcohol. With an alkene from chapter 8, we know that that was a Markonikov alcohol, and we did not have rearrangement or anything ugly like that. Well, the same thing happens with alkynes. We're going to add um, our mercury here. Water is going to attack. Um, we don't have to worry about a two-step reaction because the mercurial is very unstable here. So it just falls apart by itself. Bottom line is, we're going to put a hydroxyl group on one of these carbons. They're both the same, so it doesn't matter. Now that's going to be an enol. <coughs> and remember the enol is going to undergo this rearrangement into a ketone. So, one more time. This is going to give us our Konikov addition. Doesn't matter here because they're the same. <clears throat> we are going to put an alcohol here with a double bond that makes it an enol. The enol will undergo spontaneous rearrangement to give the ketone. Once again on the exam, please make sure that you could take something like an enol and show the flow of electrons and protons to make the carbon. If one of the metal groups was a hydrogen, it would add to the most stable right. side, right? right. If we had a, a terminal alkyne here, <clears throat> we would go to this carbon and we would get acetone. Why don't you just go through one, Dr. Young? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, why don't you just do one and you know flow of electrons to a carbonyl? Why don't you do one on the board? The um to show you know, rearrangement? Yeah. All right, I think I could probably do that. Might take you Two minutes take us about half an hour for thirty. But then you would remember it better if you did it yourself. <coughs> look at my Our intermediate here, we're going to put the hydroxyl group, let's say, on this carbon. One of these has to work, right? So we're going to put the hydroxyl group on this carbon. Our intermediate, therefore, is going to look like this. Okay, that's our enol. Okay. What happens in the rearrangement? over and the rearrangement we take the electrons from here and move them in that's going to give us our double bond take the electrons from our double bond and move them out and they're going to pick up a proton so this guy here And when we do all that, 
we wind up with the ketone. Any questions? Yeah. So the first step is like the mercury part. Don't uh, you don't have to worry about the mercury part so much. What happens with the mercury is it will sit on the pi cloud. It'll activate uh, the carbon towards substitution. Water will add to one of these carbons. This guy's in this case, and <clears throat> you wind up with the enol. All right, back to real time. All right, our next reaction, a very simple Grignard reaction. We are taking phenyl magnesium bromide. How do we make this? We take bromobenzene and simply react it with magnesium metal. Phenyl magnesium bromide, remember this behaves as if it's a carbanion at this carbon. We are taking formaldehyde, <coughs> the Grignard reagent, the carbanion in, is going to add to the carbonyl carbon. This is going to become an OH. Since this is formaldehyde, we wind up with a primary alcohol. And what we have here is simply benzyl alcohol. We have taken our benzene ring and added our CH2OH. Yeah. Which one acts like a carbon? Which carbon? The, in a greater reagent, the carbon that's attached to the magnesium has a strong negative charge. And that's our nucleophile. Terms of nucleophile and electrophile. McMurray likes that. This is our nucleophilic carbon. That's our electrophilic carbon. All right, the next set. We are on page two, I think. On your final exam, you can probably expect four pages of reactions. So it will cover all the alkene, all the substitution, elimination, and all of these guys as well. All right. We have an alkyne. It's an unsymmetrical alkyne, which means that the groups on either end are different. And we are doing a reduction. We are adding hydrogen to our triple bond, but we're doing so in the presence of a poisoned catalyst. Remember, a Linmar catalyst is just a lousy catalyst. It's, it's poisoned. It's, it's still powerful enough to reduce an alkyne, but it will not reduce an alkene. Okay, alkynes are easier, they have more electrons. So what happens here is we get a partial reduction. We're going to go from the alkyne to the alkene. Just like we saw <coughs> with alkenes, when we have reduction on a catalyst surface, both hydrogens come on from the same side. That is, they come on cis. So we're going to wind up here with an alkene that has cis stereochemistry. Both hydrogens come on from the same side. Poison catalyst will reduce a triple bond, but not a double bond. All right, POCO3 and pyridine.
Phosphorus oxychloride reacts with alcohols, and we're going to form a phosphate ester. Phosphate ester is a very good leaving group. Basically the same sort of stuff that we saw with the phosphide ester with PBR3. Here we're doing this in the presence of pyridine. Pyridine is an organic base. It's a solvent, so it's everywhere. Because it's a base, and because we're converting the OH into a good leaving group, what we're going to do here is an elimination reaction. It's a simple E2 elimination. Remember when we do an E2 elimination, we're going to remember Seitz's rule. The most highly substituted alkene will be formed. So there are two possible alkenes we could eliminate along the terminal carbons here, carbons 1 and 2. Or we could eliminate this way, uh, carbons 2 and 3. That would give us a more highly substituted Therefore, this is the product we get. And again, it's a simple E2 elimination. Now our next reaction, there's nothing poisoned about this catalyst. This is plain old platinum on charcoal. Very powerful catalyst is what we use to reduce alkenes back in chapter 8. This will reduce this first into an alkene, but because it is such a powerful catalyst, before the stuff leaves the surface, it will react with a second mole of hydrogen and reduce it all the way. So basically we're going to convert the alkyne into an alkane. And the alkane just simply looks like that. All right, our next reaction. I put this in just so we would remember uh, what we did earlier for the alkynes. This is hydroboration oxidation, and it's a simple alkene. It's actually a chapter 8 reaction, but we do the same reaction with an alkyne. Um, we know from chapter 8 Hydroboration oxidation is going to give us an anti Markovnikov alcohol. It also uh, goes with syn addition. That is, the hydrogen and the OH go on the same face of the molecule. Okay? So we look at this. Which of these is the anti Markovnikov carbon? Well, that's a tertiary carbon. That would be a more stable carbocation. Therefore, we're talking about putting the OH here. When we do that, we also are going to put the hydrogen here, and it's going to be on the same face of the molecule. We could show that using our wedge bonds, something like this. Here I've shown the methyl group going back, hydrogen and hydroxyl on the same face, that's a cis addition, or syn addition, to the anti-Markonikov carbon. Any question? <clears throat> I wouldn't do it on this exam, but on the final exam, I would not be above asking you to do this reaction and then assign the stereochemistry at each of these points.
easy to do. Hydrogen is back, isn't it? So that's our first priority. This will be our second. That's our third. That's clockwise. This guy's R. This one here, that's going to be our high priority. <clears throat> this will be second. That will be third. That's going counterclockwise. But the hydrogen is forward. <coughs> So this is also our configuration. On the final, you should be able to do that. And the next four. Once again, we are taking an alkyne. We have aqueous acid and we have mercury. We've done this before. We know that this is going to give us a Markhonikov enol. So we need to look at our two carbons, decide which of them is the Markhonikov carbon. This is the terminal. This guy is attached to another carbon. So we're talking carbon number two here will get the hydroxyl group of the enol. Because it's on carbon number two, we're going to wind up with a ketone, aren't we? This is going to be a CH3. This is our carbonyl group. And it will look like that. We make a Markhonikov enol on carbon number two of our alkyne. Our next guy, we have a carboxylate ester. And we're reacting that with a Grignard reagent. Now we know that carboxylate esters add one mole of Grignard to form a carbonyl compound. That then adds a second mole of Grignard to form an alcohol. We lose the alkoxy part of our ester. It's gone. You never, ever see it again. Wash it down the drain. What we're going to do is add two of these methyl groups from our methyl magnesium bromide to the carbonyl carbon, and we're going to wind up with a tertiary alcohol. The structure should look something like this. Two moles of the methyl magnesium bromide add to the carbonyl carbon. The methoxy group is lost, and you never see it. questions. Esters typically will give tertiary alcohols. The only exception, of course, is that this is a formate ester. That is, we have a hydrogen on this side and an alkoxy on this side. That gives second. Once again, review from chapter 8. All we're doing here is Markhonikov hydration, right? It's a reaction that yields an alcohol. A simple aqueous acid, HCl, something like that. Um, sulfuric acid, phosphoric acid even. <clears throat> All we're going to do is introduce a hydroxyl group right here on the Markhonikov carbon. It's a reaction involving a carbocation intermediate. We can get rearrangement and ugly stuff. Here it's a clean reaction to give to propanol. Now we're using thiodyl chloride. 
it's going to convert our alcohol into an alkyl chloride. We remember that we have two reactions of thiamine chloride we want to remember. If we do this in something like pyridine, a nice polar solvent, nice organic polar solvent, we get an SN2 reaction occurring with inversion. However, if we do this in a nonpolar solvent, like pentane, what happens is we make the chlorosulfide ester, and this rearranges with a front side rearrangement, an SNI mechanism, and we get the alkyl chloride with retention of configuration. So two reactions to remember. This is thionyl chloride and pentane. Um, sometimes this is simply stated as nonpolar solvent. The thionyl chloride in a nonpolar solvent is an alkyl chloride with retention. Simplest way to show retention is just to rip off the OH, put a chlorine in its place, and it looks like that. On the exam, you would have to draw a structure with stereochemistry so that um, it's clear that you know this goes with retention or inversion. Any questions? All right, if we take a terminal alkyne and react it with sodium metal, we make the sodium um, alkyne anion. Well, you can do the same thing with lithium. Just react the alkyne with lithium. Hydrogen gas bubbles off, and we wind up with the alkyne lithium, alkynal lithium. This is a good nucleophile. It's also a very strong base. In a case like this, we're going to use this alkynal lithium as a nucleophile. The only electrophile we have in our pot is the carbonyl carbon. So what's going to happen? is the carbon ion here is going to attack the carbonyl and we're going to make an alcohol. All we've done is make this bond here between the alkyne, what used to be the carbonyl carbon, which is now the OH group. Questions. Once again, a chapter eight reaction. Just like adding water to an alkyne in the presence of mercury to give a Markonikov alcohol or enol, here we're going to add water to a double bond in the presence of mercury to give a Markonikov alcohol. <coughs> you look at the two here, you pick out your Markonikov center, that's going to be this guy, and all in the world we're going to do is make that an alcohol, and we are, uh, we remember that there are no rearrangements or ugly things that happen. Our next reaction, this is sodium actively dissolving in liquid ammonia. Different from sodium previously dissolved in liquid ammonia. When you dissolve sodium in something like liquid ammonia, or water for that matter, what happens is it evolves hydrogen gas. The process of evolving hydrogen gas actually <coughs> produces hydrogen radicals. So this is a radical reaction. Because it's a radical reduction of our triple bond, 
it's going to happen stepwise. That is, hydrogen radicals going to come in, bond to one of these carbons. Then a second hydrogen radical will come in and bind to the other. Because it is stepwise, as opposed to the catalytic reduction, where it all happens at once, because it's stepwise, this is going to form the most stable alkene. The most stable alkene is going to be trans. So, what we're doing here is a trans reduction. Start off with our alkyne. We simply make the trans alkene. Because it's radical, and we form an intermediate, the intermediate adopts the most stable conformation, which will be trans, then picks up the other hydrogen to give the alkene. All right, three more on our reaction pages. Here we have a primary alcohol. Remember, PCC is short for <coughs> pyridinium chloral chromate. Um, this is a stabilized version of CrO3. CrO3 uh, is a strong oxidizing agent. It will convert carbonyls, I'm sorry, convert alcohols into carbonyls or carboxylic acids, that's CrO3. When you make the pyridinium chlorochromate version, it's much less powerful, like a poisoned catalyst, if you will. And because of that, the oxidation here is going to stop at the carbonyl stage instead of going all the way to um, a carboxylic acid. If we convert this OH into a carbonyl, that means that this carbon is going to be an aldehyde. So this will stop at the aldehyde, and it will look like this. This is actually a very useful reaction because aldehydes are really tough to make. Aldehydes are easily converted to the carboxylic acid by most things, even by air. POCO3, pyridine. We remember once again, this is going to form a phosphate ester. In the presence of pyridine, we will get a nice, clean, happy E2 elimination. Therefore, we're going to get a double bond in our ring. If we had a choice, we would form the site sap product. This is just a cyclopentane, so it doesn't matter. And we just get cyclopentene. And now finally, we have an alcohol. We have thionyl chloride and pyridine. This is our other option. We remember that in pyridine, we're going to get an alkyl chloride with inversion of configuration. One more time, one, one more time. The easiest way to show an inversion is just to take your stereo center here and just swap the orientations. So we're going to wind up with chlorine back, hydrogen front, and it should look like this. And on the final exam, if we had this, I would feel comfortable asking you to assign the serial configuration around the <coughs> Let's see, with this one, chlorine is high priority, that's number two, that's number three, so we're going 
one, two, three, that's clockwise, but the hydrogen is in the front, so that means this is S. Here, this would be carbon one, that would be carbon two, carbon three, we're going this way, that's S, Our hydrogen is forward, therefore this is R. You should be able to do it just that quickly. Any questions? All right, that's your two pages of reactions. Now the next one is kind of a synthesis sort of question. You might see something like this. You might see something slightly different. Here, I'm simply asking you to start with phenyl uh, ethine and to make all of these compounds. Um, on the actual exam, this question might be slightly different. Remember on the uh, problem set we had <coughs> a bunch of uh, potential starting materials, and you had to you know, do syntheses based on those. It could look something like that. Uh, it could be a mixture of the two. But you know, this some sort of a synthesis problem. All right, our first one up here. We are taking our triple bond, and we are making a double bond out of it. Now. Because this is a terminal alkyne, we don't have to worry about stereochemistry. But we have to make sure that we don't reduce this all the way to the alkane. There are two reactions that we could do. We could do the dissolving um, metal reduction, sodium and liquid ammonia, or we could do the Lindlar catalyst. Once again, if this was uh, had a methyl group here, this would give us cis addition, this would give us trans. But because we have a terminal alkyne, they both work. On the exam, either one of those would work fine. Our next one. We look at this and say, what type of molecule is it? Well, it's a ketone. I know how to make ketones from alcohols by oxidation, stuff like that. I can also make it from an alkyne by hydration, the pulmonino. So we need to look at this and say, where is the oxygen attached? Is it attached to the Markhanikov or the anti Markhanikov carbon? Well, this is a terminal. This is attached to a benzene ring. It's a benzyl position, actually. So this is the Markhanikov position. Therefore, we need to do a Markhanikov addition of water to our triple bond. We remember that we can do that simply by taking aqueous acid and a touch of mercury and form the enol, which rearranges to give the ketone. <coughs> Our next one, we look and we see, okay, we start with an alkyne, we wind up with an alkyne. All we've done is stick on two extra carbons. Now, in order to do that, we need to use our alkyne as a nucleophile and do an SN2 reactor. What we're going to do is convert this to the alkyne anion with sodium amide. That sodium previously dissolved in liquid ammonia. And then we're going to react it with an alkyl halide. Here we need a two-carbon alkyl halide. So something like bromoethane uh, or iodoethane, whatever would work. Step one, 
sodium amide, step two, the alkyl halide, again a two carbon alkyl halide. Yeah. Uh, no, remember that that's the other way around. Linear is a nucleophile. The alkyl, the carbon on the alkyl chloride or alkyl bromide is an electrophile. So it's looking for electrons. Linear has electrons to spare. And our last one. We're taking our triple bond here and we're just cutting it in half. This is an oxidation. We're going to oxidize this guy all the way down. The simplest way to do that is to use a very powerful oxidant. The one that we used back in chapter 8 was simply permanganate. Remember from chapter 8, we have two permanganate reactions. If we do it in acid, that's an oxidation that will give us carbonyl compounds or carboxylic acids. If we do it in base, <coughs> we get a cis 1,2 diol. So this is the acidic. Again, all we're doing here is splitting this. This carbon becomes CO2. This guy becomes a carboxylic acid. Sorry? We have a different structure. Oh, you do? Yeah, we don't have the OH with the CO2. Sure. Yeah. Oh, so you do. Is it the same? No. Well, no. <laughs> Gee, <laughs> where did that come from? Um, okay. Uh, in order to get the one that's on your sheet, let's just pretend. Oh my gosh, yeah. This is Raise this up much. again. On your sheet, you have an aldehyde, don't you? So, we have a benzene ring. <coughs> we have one CH2, and then we have an aldehyde. All right, so if we want to make this, we would look at this and say, this is an aldehyde. What we have done is simply convert our triple bond here into an enol, and the oxygen is bonded to the anti markonikov carbon. That's this guy, the terminal carbon. In order to do that, what we would have to do is simply hydroboration, oxidation. So BH3 and THF, followed by oxidative workup with peroxide. Just like we did in Chapter 8 to make anti marconikov alcohols. What was before the peroxide? I'm sorry? What was it before the peroxide or in the peroxide? Um, it's just alkaline peroxide. Go back and look at the uh, uh, reactions we did. We've done this a couple of times. All right. On your exam, you will also have a mechanism problem. It could be a free radical mechanism like this. Um, it could be a um, mechanism involving oh, enols or esters or radios or something like that. Well, you have to show arrows um, and stuff, you know, those sorts of things. This is simply the chlorination of methane for your example. The types of things that we want to see in a mechanism problem are that you can 
show the flow of electrons at every step. Four, the chlorination of methane. We have to show three basic steps. Initiation, propagation, and termination. The initiation <coughs> step. All in the world you do there is make radicals. Now, for chlorination, that's simple. We take chlorine or bromine and shine a light on it. And the chlorine-chlorine bond absorbs the photon's worth of energy. That's enough to split the bond here, giving each chlorine one electron. We show that with these little arrows. These are half arrowheads. Remember, a full arrowhead is used for electron pair. A half arrowhead is used for a single electron. And we wind up here with two chlorine radicals. All right, that's initiation. What we do next is the <coughs> propagation step. This is a free radical chain reaction. Now, a chain reaction means that we're going to start off here with a radical. That's our chlorine radical we just made. And we wind up down here with the same chlorine radical. So it propagates as a chain, just goes around and around and around and around until it happens. For the mechanism of the propagation, you would have to show chlorine abstracting a hydrogen atom, so pulling off hydrogen at one electron, leaving the one electron here on the carbon. Once again, the way you would do this on the exam is to draw these happy little curvy arrows. Once we get the methyl radical, this is going to react with another mole of chlorine. <clears throat> Once again, we pull off a chlorine atom. This electron goes with the other chlorine to give the chlorine radical and our product, chloromethane. It's a chain reaction because we start with a chlorine radical and we wind up with one. Anytime you do a free radical chain, this is what you have to do. You have to start and end with the same radical. Once we've done our propagation, this is going to go until it terminates. Termination is nothing more than any two radicals coming together to form a non-radical species. <coughs> two chlorines could bump in. To make chlorine, <clears throat> these two radicals could combine to make chloromethane. These two could combine to make ethane, etc. And the list goes on and on. <coughs> Any questions? So, Dr. Young, the chapters that are cover on this E3 exam is uh, chapter 8, 9, 10, and 17? Yeah. No, not 8. Uh, 9, 10, 17. 8 was alkenes. Only reactions out of chapter 8 um, are the ones that yield alcohols. So we need to review those. Putting them all together. Initiation. We make radicals. Propagation. Start with one. Wind up with the same one. Termination. We destroy our radical species. Again, there will be a mechanisms question. Won't be this one, but there will be something, okay? And our last question on the exam was a symmetrical vineyard sort of question. Now, we did lots of these in our practice session. This is no more than that. Here we're making this substituted benzyl alcohol. And all I want you to do is to do it by two pathways. First pathway, I want you to show the ally that you want to use. You're going to react that with magnesium to make the Grignard. 
resulting in structure of the vineyard. And then finally, carbonyl compound in your reactive vineyard with to make this. We remember that when we do a vineyard question like this, we want to start by splitting on one side or the other of our alcohol. Because this bond and this bond could have been made in the Grignard synthesis. So let's just split here. If we just split here, then the Grignard reagent would basically add in the fiddle group. So we need a phenyl grignard reagent. Now in order to do that, we need to start off with an aryl halide. So we have a halogen at this point. I believe the simplest is just to do something like bromobenzene. So our first box, we put in Bromobenzene. If we react bromobenzene with magnesium and ether, we form our greater reagent, which is nothing more than phenyl magnesium bromide. Now, the other half of our little split thing here was a carbonyl fraction. The OH you're going to redraw as a carbonyl carbon. Here it has a hydrogen attached, that's not shown, so it's an aldehyde. And attached to that aldehyde, we simply have a two carbon chain. Something like that would work. Take phenyl magnesium bromide, propanal, and we make this substituted benzyl alcohol. Any questions? All right, the other half of the question we want to split on the other side. So we split off our phenyl ring. This time, now we want to split here. Our alkyl halide. Well, this is the chunk that we added with our Grignard, isn't it? It's simply a two carbon <coughs> chunk. So that's an ethyl group. Alkyl halide that you could draw here would simply be two carbons bonded to a halogen. Bromoethane would work. If we take bromoethane reacted with magnesium and ether, we will make ethyl magnesium bromide. Now our carbonyl chunk. Again, this is a secondary alcohol, which means that this is going to be an aldehyde. Only thing attached to the aldehyde is our benzene ring, so our carbonyl compound is just benzaldehyde. Ethyl magnesium bromide adds to benzaldehyde, adds to the carbonyl carbon, gives the secondary alcohol, and our substituted benzyl alcohol. Now that was simple, wasn't it? I sat here and I talked like mad for an hour. You could have done this test in 20 minutes. Remember, on the exam, you can bring a 3x5 card with little bits and pieces of things to remind yourself. Um, it covers chapters 9, 10, and 17. Remember, out of chapter 8, we also are including those reactions that yield alcohols. So hydration, 
<coughs> high chloration um, reaction with potassium permanganate to give a cis-1,2 diol. 